Uh, yeah, Ashwin, we are going live now. All right. You can start. Are we live? Yes, you can start. All right. 533. Um, hello, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome and good evening to all of you who have joined us today at Tamil Heritage Trust's October monthly talk. Um, many of you have been here before and are regular attendees of our monthly talks. Some of you may be new. And for you, we would like to introduce um, Tamil Heritage Trust, the institution, and the work we do. Tamil Heritage Trust, or THT as it's fondly called, um, was established in 2010 as a volunteer-driven um, organization or institution um, whose primary objective really was, as the slide says, to understand, appreciate, celebrate, and most importantly, also disseminate um, the wonders of India's heritage. So that's been the single-minded focus of Tamil Heritage Trust from 2010. And that in turn has translated to um, a basket of activities, events, um, and other showpieces, uh, which Tamil Heritage Trust has created for its audience. And um, to start with, of course, are, um, are the monthly heritage talks. This itself being one such monthly heritage talk. And um, this is perhaps our oldest event and has been continuously running um, right from uh, the trust's inception. Um, these talks are held on the first Saturday of every month in an online digital format, uh, which then allows um, us to not only draw speakers from across the country, but also draw audiences from across the country. Um, the spread of the talks itself is, is wide and varied. And we have had the good fortune of having some stalwarts speak at this forum. And you'll see a small collection of uh, talks from the past here on this slide. In the talk format itself, um, somewhat new, um, roughly a year old, is another monthly heritage talk which we have started. But this one is largely for local audiences in Tamil Nadu, uh, in Tamil, and the speakers speak in Tamil too. And this is held on the third Saturday of every month um, in, a, in a hybrid format, which means it's not only streamed online live, uh, but it's also actually held in a physical venue in the city. Um, so there are audiences which join us in person as well, right? So these are the two offerings which PhD has uh, under the talk umbrella. We also organize something called Peche uh, Kacheri, quite literally translating into a concert of talks, um, typically held in December in Chennai, uh, the music season. And um, we've had um, close to 10 editions, if not more of, of Pecha Kacheri. The last one in 2022 was on the Vijayanagara dynasty. And as you can see from the list, um, we've covered um, quite a few of, um, of uh, the large dynasties of not just South India, uh, but also Orissa, uh, and a few other topics of choice like Indian paintings. Um, this December, we will have the Peche Kacheri too, and um, you should stay tuned to find out what the theme for this year's um, um, Peche Kacheri is. So this is um, um, a, a small snapshot of what happened last year at Peche Kacheri. This was on Vijayanagara, as I had said. Um, what we've been doing for the last three years now is also hosting something called the Indology Festival. Um, this, is, um, uh, this is a somewhat grand vision we have where um, we hope to be able to attract speakers of international repute, right? Um, both from academia, research, uh, as well as subject matter experts. And we have had uh, three editions of the Indology Festival. Uh, the very first one was held in 2020 uh, in the, at the peak of the pandemic, and it was, um, it was an online format. And that online format has continued for the next two years as well. So we've had one on temple builders of medieval India, and the latest one was uh, Sagara Sangama, uh, which was held earlier this year in, in June. And uh, we had um, seven days packed with uh, 14 very, very engaging talks by excellent speakers. Um, all of these talks uh, have been archived on uh, Tamil Heritage Trust's YouTube channel, 
And uh, I think we take a fair bit of pride in now looking back um, um, at the work which has been done and seeing that um, we've created a fairly large collection of top quality video content on topics of heritage, history, architecture, and art, right? Uh, and these are talks delivered by speakers across the country uh, on a wide, wide range of topics. Um, so it's a veritable library, a reference library in itself. And I think that's something which gives us a lot of satisfaction. Um, talks apart, talks and conferences apart, um, we also do hands-on workshops, which are far more interactive, um, first-hand kind of experiences, um, which have been created um, um, for our audiences and patrons. And um, we do two almost every other month. And these two are how to see a temple, which we call House At, and how to see a museum, uh, House Am. Uh, and the museum in question here is um, the Madras Museum or the Chennai Museum, which has one of the most... Um, um, what should I say, valuable collections of uh, bronze icons, but also stone sculptures uh, and many, many other um, uh, heritage artifacts. Um, so these are, uh, like I said, uh, physical workshops held here in Chennai, but we do have participants traveling from nearby cities like Bangalore and Hyderabad as well. Um, we also do something called a site seminar, which is an annual event. Uh, which is um, uh, essentially a study tour of around 40 to 50 participants. Um, uh, and this group travels to a place of heritage value in the country. Uh, but the preparation for this uh, starts well before the actual trip itself. Uh, so for an extended period of two to three months, each of the participants of the study tour pick one topic which is relevant to the site being visited, uh, thoroughly research it, right and prepare a presentation which they share shared back with the rest of the group so the idea is um, you first invest in an intensive amount of study um, and then actually physically travel to the place um, and then one is able to appreciate it much much better than just being a casual visitor um, we have a few more um, rather young offerings so this one is called alamar away right um, which is really targeted uh, at teachers, at school teachers largely, and it is a capacity building program which, uh, which sensitizes teachers um, uh, to heritage, uh, understanding its value, but also being, being able to appreciate the nuances of Indian art and architecture. Um, so we've had two batches. The second batch actually is in session, and these are typically cohorts of uh, 40 to 50 teachers um, who participate. Um, a rather unique uh, initiative of ours, um, unique because uh, I doubt that there is any other comparable um, uh, award uh, in the country at the moment, but this is an award exclusively for epigraphy and which recognizes the work of epigraphists and it is named for V. Venkaya, the foremost um, um, uh, Indian epigraphist really. And um, in fact, uh, the award for this year was just given out a couple of months back in July. And this year's award went to Dr. P. V. Krishnamurti, uh, a person who works um, on um, uh, this, this rather fascinating area of Kannada inscriptions in Tamil land, right? Or, um, or, or the land of Tamil. Um, something which, uh, which is very close to our hearts um, and uh, uh, for all the right reasons is, is the Tamil Heritage Trust Professor S. Swaminathan Heritage Award. And this award is named for Professor S. Swaminathan, um, a co-founder of the Tamil Heritage Trust um, and uh, to honor his um, contribution and his vision in creating this trust. And uh, we've had now four award winners and you can see Professor Swaminathan giving away the awards um, uh, from 2020 onwards. And this year's award, we had our first um, uh, woman awardee, uh, Professor Devi um, from Madurai, right? Um, and this is something which, uh, which has been gradually gathering momentum and has created an impetus um, amongst um, young contributors in the area of uh, history and heritage. Um, you can always uh, keep in touch with us, like I said, one, by browsing our YouTube channel for, uh, for our content. Uh, but for anything else, you can also write in to us at admin at tamilheritage.in and we'd be very happy to, um, to write back to you. 
um, and help you in any way possible. Um, so that's the introduction about um, Tamil Heritage Trust. But very quickly coming um, uh, to today's event and today's talk um, and what promises to be uh, a very, very fascinating talk um, on the Rameshwara cave of Elora. Um, we have a very illustrious uh, speaker today, Professor Deepak Kanal, and we are very grateful uh, to him for accepting our invitation and immediately agreeing to talk at this forum. Um, Professor Deepak Kanal is an art historian, um, uh, a sculptor, and a playwright. Um, he was uh, the head of the department and the dean um, at the Department of Art History and Aesthetics at the, at the distinguished uh, MS University of Baroda in the Faculty of Fine Arts. Um, Professor Kanal um, has, has been a renowned academic and has had a long um, a track record of, uh, of top class research. And this is reflected in the long list of publications um, which are out in his name, which include four books, a monograph, five edited volumes, three journals. Uh, and very interestingly, um, he describes himself as part playwright as well, along um, with wearing his academic hat. And uh, he has three full length plays to his credit and three dance dramas as well. Um, so really our speaker today um, uh, brings in I think um, uh, a certain lens, which is which is multidimensional in its nature, and I'm sure all of that is going to be reflected in today's talk. Um, Professor Kanal is an authority on Elora cave sculpture, um, having dedicated his entire life to studying the subject. Um, he has spoken um, and, in fact, also been organizer uh, in many seminars uh, across both the country uh, and globally as well, um, and has spoken at several prestigious. Um, forums in, in India, US, and the UK, and has also been um, on prestigious chairs instituted by various academies, museums, and universities. Um, Professor Kunnel's most significant contribution in art history um, is really his teaching methodology and interpretation of Indian sculpture and Indian aesthetics. Uh, and I think this is largely informed by his multiple interests and talents as well. Um, his research on the correspondence between Indian linguistic theories and Indian sculpture uh, conducted under the aegis of the Tagore National Fellowship has been published in a book form titled as Drigambrini. And I think we have um, uh, a visual, um, visual of that publication coming up in the next few slides. Professor Kanal has been, um, uh, Pro Professor Kanal's work has been widely celebrated and recognized and feted, and uh, he's been a recipient of a number of awards, scholarships, and distinctions uh, spanning sculpture, theater, and art history. Uh, and um, I've listed some of these recognitions here, and this list is not exhaustive, um, but uh, there's the very prestigious Charles Wallace Fellowship from Cambridge. Um, there's an honorable mention from the National Lalit Kala Academy, uh, awards from the Gujarat Lalit Kala Academy, uh, the AP Council National Award, the Gujarat Gaurav Puraskar, and the Raja Ravi Varma Samman Award as well. So here are some visuals of, um, of uh, Professor Kanal's work, the publication. So on the right, you see Drigambrini, which I referred to earlier, um, but also Elora on the left, uh, which we will hear more of from Professor Kanal. Um, a few more um, visuals of, um, of Professor Kanal's work. And um, this is some information on his dance drama, Deep the Kailasha, which narrates the history of uh, the monolith, the Kailashanada monolith of Elora and the various myths associated with it. Um, and uh, I think um, in what, uh, what has been a very rare and uh, um, uh, prestigious kind of performance, um, the dance drama itself was enacted in the vicinity of the caves. So with that, um, um, I would like to invite uh, today's speaker, Professor Deepak Kanal, um, uh, to start his presentation. Thank you very much, sir, again for, uh, um, for agreeing to speak at our forum, and uh, we're deeply indebted to you. Looking forward to your talk, sir. Thank you so much, Ashwinji and Shamji, for inviting me on this prestigious forum and for the kind of Uh, I think I'm mute. 
So we can hear you, sir. Can you can you just speak speak up, please? Yes. Oh, you can you can hear me. We can hear it you. Shows that I was muted. Any. So I'm Any. just going to go off. I'm going to go off video, sir, and you can share your screen and start your talk. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Can you see my share screen? Ah, uh, yes, sir. we can see your screen. Uh, but it's a Zoom screen, so the slides will have to come up yet. Uh, okay. Now? Yes. And uh, now we need to get into the uh, full screen mode. Yeah. Yes. So thanks once again for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, I was asked to speak about Elora. Uh, and I felt that instead of talking about Elora in general or the Kailashanatha temple, which is often talked about, I will focus on a very beautiful, very important and very significant cave, which is the Rameshwar cave, cave number 21, where we can see, start seeing the confluence of regional lineages. Actually, before we start talking about Elora, I think we need to talk about this Rameshwar cave is considered to be one of the caves from the early phase of Elora. Now, as all of you, I don't know what kind of audience am I addressing. Uh, it's quite possible that people are quite conversant with all this information. If I repeat them, please excuse me. Elora normally is uh, divided into four phases. The earliest phase is perhaps the Vaishnavite phase. And there are a couple of caves which are, which are placed in that, that particular phase. But the major work at Elora starts from the second phase, which is the Shaivite phase of Elora. Rameshwar cave, Dumar Lena, and uh, cave number 14, which is popularly known as Ravan Ki Khai, and most of the Buddhist caves can be placed in this second phase. And normally, this phase is placed in 6th century, from 530 onwards. Uh, this particular cave, cave number 21, Rameshwar cave, is attributed to the Kalachuris. And as we know, that the Elephanta cave is also attributed to Kalachuris. There are several reasons why this cave, there, there, there is a big debate about the patronage of this cave. And some of the scholars attributed, attributed to uh, Chalukyans. But now, I think uh, there is hardly any doubt about the Kalachuri patronage of it because we have found some Kalachuri coins in the, in the vicinity of this particular cave. And similar caves were found at Elephanta also. So, but of course, we must not forget that the patronage is not very important. I always feel that the artist is always neglected in the Indian art historical studies. And we are going to focus more on the artist and the art community rather than the patronage. This advent of Kalachuri reign in this region is attributed to, uh, attributed to last, last quarter of uh, fifth century. Uh, mainly relying on the Dashakumara Charita. We know that the Dashakumara Charita is not a historical book. It is, it is a kind of uh, a, a creative creative uh, text. But in Dashakumara Charita, there are some stories which uh, show a very marked uh, analogy with the things which are the, histor with the historical uh, events that took place in that particular region. And uh, Dr. Mirash, tried to relate the Shakumar Charita with the history of Deccan in 5th century. Keeping that in mind, he felt that the Kalachuris seems to have crossed over Narmada and entered into Deccan sometime in the last decades of 5th century, which is quite, quite dependable because that is the period when they start showing their presence in this region. So, uh, now we will switch over to the aesthetic part of 
Ajanta is one of the major uh, monuments in this region, which goes back to second century BC. And we know that it can be seen in two phases. The first phase is the Satavahana phase, which popularly is known as the Hinayana phase. And then the Mahayana phase is attributed to Vakatakas. Now, stylistically speaking, the Mahayana phase shows some affinity with the Gupta sculpture. And that is why some scholars try to establish Gupta influence on Ajanta sculpture. But we must not forget that according to one of the major scholars on Ajanta, Dr. 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 Spink, the work at Ajanta stopped at 477 AD. I personally do not, uh, do not uh, subscribe to this opinion, but a large part of Ajanta was, was done by that time. And particularly cave number 19, which is one of, one of the most significant caves of Ajanta, considering the sculpture of it. If you see the sculpture of uh, cave number 19, it shows affinity with Gupta sculpture. But the date of that sculpture is somewhere around 470. And the dated Gupta sculptures are dated in 478. Now it is difficult to subscribe to the idea of Gupta influence. So we will have to give a thought. Why I'm talking about it? Because I'm trying to establish the, uh, the, 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 the regional lineages in Elora. It seems that the Ajanta idiom is formulated. It is, it is, it is a confluence of several idioms which come from different places. In Gujarat, there are two important, uh, two, two import, Im, 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 important monuments. One is Devni Mori, which was a terracotta stupa. Unfortunately, the stupa got submerged in the, in the, in the backwaters of a dam. And uh, most of that sculpture has been shifted to the Department of Archaeology in MS University of Baroda. These sculptures are terracotta sculptures and show a marked affinity with later Kushana sculpture. Now, these terracotta sculptures from uh, from, from, from Devni Modi show similarity with Ajanta sculpture also. The sculpture on the right, the first two sculptures are from Devni Modi. The last sculpture is from Ajanta cave number 26. If you see these sculptures, they are very similar to each other. One more sculpture from cave number 26 of Elora. You can see that the iconography, the posture, the physiognomy, the facial features, all those things are very similar to each other. And Devni Mori is placed before Gupta by most of the scholars, including the person who excavated that site, R.N. Mehta. Professor R.N. Mehta excavated it. U.P. Shah is another important scholar who also places uh, Devni Mori and Shamaraji prior to Gupta. Baroda Museum also has a very large collection of Shamaraji sculpture. Shamaraji is one of the places. Normally, the sculpture is identified as Shamaraji sculpture, but there are many places around like Tintoi and Roda where you find huge hordes of sculptures. And those sculptures show a marked affinity, marked analogy with the sculpture found in the Mumbai region. The sculpture on the right is from Parel. The sculpture on the left is from Shamraji. One more example. Again, the sculpture on the left is from Shamraji region. The one on the right is from Parel. Parel, Shivdi, or Elephanta show a very marked similarity with uh, Gujarat sculpture. And even some of the some of the scholars from Mumbai, like Dr. Gorakshakar, has also accepted this affinity. So what I'm trying to bring home is the sculpture from Kaneri. Western India has its own tradition. We have an earlier sculptural tradition in Ajanta. We have so many sculptural, so many cave, cave, cave temples in Western Western India. So the Western Indian, uh, the the uh, Western Indian sculpture, which was already there, like Kaneri, then the sculpture from Shamaraji, Devni Mori, 
and the sculpture of Parel Shivdi, all of them together can be considered as the Western Indian school. The uh, the the the, the uh, influence comes from the West, and then at at Elephanta, it's get culminated. Elephanta can be considered as the culmination of this Western Indian idiom. I'm trying to establish these idioms, and then we'll try to see how these idioms can be seen in Ra Rameshwar Cave or Cave Number Twenty One of Ellora. Now, what exactly are the salient feature, are, are, the, are, the, uh, uh, are the characteristic features of this culture of Western India? They're extremely contemplative, and that is why they normally are mistook with Gupta sculpture. The contemplative element which we see in Gupta sculpture, that the same classical element can be seen in Western, idiom, uh, Western Indian idiom also. Many scholars try to try to read Gupta influence on Western Indian sculpture precisely because of this contemplative element. But if you see the facial features, they differ from Gupta. The thick lower lip is a salient feature of Western Indian idiom, where it differs from Gupta, Gupta uh, sculpture. And the most important thing, which I think uh, I've, I've pleaded this particular feature very vehemently in my writing, that is the activation of space. I think the treatment of space in Western Indian sculpture is radically different than the Gupta sculpture. If you see the Gupta sculpture, the Gupta sculpture are placed against a stele. The stele is a blind stele. The stele is a neutral background. The background in Gupta sculpture doesn't play any role in the sculpture. Try to recollect Sarnath sculpture. Try to recollect Mathura, Mathura sculpture. All the Gupta sculptures do not belong to their space. The space is neutral. But if you see the Western Indian sculpture, the sculpture emerges from the space. The space is totally activated. There is a big turmoil that takes place in the space. And you can see the volume emerging and receding into the space. The volume literally emerges. The sculpture emerges from the space and also recedes into the space. I, I will not be able to discuss these elements and explain them in details. But I will just show you an example and keeping that in mind, we'll proceed further to our uh, core, core topic. This is a sculpture from Elephanta. Now see, this sculpture belongs to that space. It appears as if that it is, it is emerging the, from that space. And see these, these uh, uh, Dikpalas. Now these Dikpalas, they, they, are, they are like clouds. They emerge from that space. In Gupta sculpture, you never find this kind of thing. This activated space is a very important feature of Western Indian idiom. And that is why I want to treat it distinct from the Gupta, Gupta classicism. It is a different kind of classicism. It is an independent classicism. Of course, they share, because I think we will have to understand this moment as centrifugal and centripetal moment. The things of the Gupta elements uh, emerging and spreading out from, from the Gupta centers and the Gupta centers are also gathering uh, influences from the other regions. So it certainly is a confluence. It certainly is uh, a, a kind of amalgam. But that amalgam is not one way. That's what I'm trying to establish. Now, here we can also give a, a brief thought to the notion of Riti and Bhuti. Riti is one of the aesthetic uh, theories in India and which normally is translated as style. But style is voluntary. Style comes automatically. The Western notion of style is slightly different than the notion of Riti. Style is voluntary. Style is not controlled by an individual. Riti is a voluntary choice. The artist decides which Riti. Now, there are various Ritis. Perhaps all of you are conversant with it. We know about Arabati. We know about Vaidarbi, we know about Satvati, and these Ritis have different temperaments. If, it, if you want to uh, portray something very intense and theatrical, you may choose Aravati for that. You may choose uh, 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 Gaudi for that. Or if you want to want to express in a very contemplative uh, manner, then perhaps uh, uh, Vaidarbi would be the right Riti, would be the correct Riti for your expression. This is how Riti, Riti is considered to be a thoughtful choice in Indian tradition. And Vritti 
is the temperament of an artist. These ritis and guttis play a very important role. Let's not forget that India is a huge country and there are monuments all over the country. But do you think that every region had its own artistic guilds? Did we have so many artists who could work on the local, pro local, local projects? It seems that these artist guilds were traveling from one place to another and they were carrying their own vrittis and vrittis with, with them. And the confluence of these vrittis and vrittis gave birth to different styles. If we do not keep this in mind, perhaps we'll be doing a great injustice to the individual expression of an artist. So these styles sometimes are regional, like Devamani, Ravnimori and Shamraji. Sometimes they are period styles because the earlier style of Gupta and the later style of Gupta is different. If you see the Chalukyan sculpture, Badami sculpture is also Chalukyan and Patadakal sculpture is also Chalukyan and there is a large, there is a vast difference between the between, between them because of the period. So there are period uh, styles, there are regional styles, there are styles of the guild. Every guild may have its own style and then there are individual styles also. So while seeing a particular monument, we will have to keep these styles in mind and try to understand the expression of the artist instead of only focusing on the date and the patronage. Now we are coming to the cave which we are going to examine. This is Rameshwara cave. Sometimes I feel a little embarrassed because the audience of such lectures is very well informed. And when you start giving very preliminary information, to them, probably they must be thinking that what the speaker is doing. But I'm, I'm obliged to do this. Please, please excuse me if you are conversant with this basic information. Now, this Rameshwar cave is a very unusual cave because the ground plan of this cave is very unusual. I have noticed that some of the unfinished caves at Elephanta also have this kind of ground plan. This has a huge courtyard in front of it. And a very rare Nandi Peter. It's not a Nandi Mandapa. It is a Nandi Peter and a very high Nandi Peter. You can, you can see the height of this. Yeah? And perhaps you know that on the western side of this Nandi Peter, there is an image of Aditi Uttana Pada, which is, which is very similar to Lajja Gavri. It, it shows some affinity to the Mahakuta Lajja Gauri. But this is this obviously is much earlier to that. Now this courtyard leads to uh, this facade, and it's a beautiful facade, an open facade. It's not a gouda mandapa, and it is decorated with beautiful pillars and bracket figures. It is the facade is flanked by the river goddesses Ganga on one side and Yamuna on the other side. So there is a parallel mandapa, which is parallel to the facade, and then the garbhagra. So we'll try to see the ground plan. This is the northern part of this facade. You can see that there is a beautiful image of Ganges, Ganga, standing on Makara, and some uh, bracket figures which almost echo the rhythm of Ganga. I hope you can see my cursor. So, so you can see that this, this sculpture is giving an echoing effect of Ganga. This image is also a beautiful image. The other side. Now, here you can see that these female figures, right from the beginning, if you have a, a discerning eye, can notice that these female figures are not exactly the same everywhere. In this single cave, you will find different rendering of the female figure. Now, see this female figure. I will show you a couple of more. This is the bracket figure. Now, see the vegetative rhythm of these sculptures. See the beautiful lyricism of these sculptures. See the treatment of the human body, which is highly naturalistic. You can see the swollen lower, lower uh, uh, abdomen and the drooping breasts. Please excuse these details because I think to, to understand the, uh, uh, the, the, the style of the sculptor, it is necessary 
who observe every detail. If you see this female figure, which is a grotesque female figure, see see her stomach. You can almost touch the. You can almost feel the softness of flesh if you touch it. Now see this treatment and check it with this image. Here the breasts are hemispherical, almost stuck to the body. And immediately we will notice that the sculptor of Ganga and the sculptor of Yamuna, or rather the guild of Ganga and the guild of Yamuna, is not the same. Perhaps the guild of Ganga and the guild of this bracket figure is the same guild. You can basically notice the sculptural understanding of, of the of, of, of these artists. Now this is the other side. So the bracket figures on the other side, they resonate. The sensibility of Yamuna, the bracket figure on the left side, they 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 they, uh, they follow the female and the the you uh, the uh, physical understanding of Ganga. This is the ground plan. Uh, now, this is the courtyard. With an Andi Mandapa, a Chandrashila, the four pillars with bracket figures, and there are two Upavarnakas, two chambers on the lateral side. This is very curious. The, the Mandapa is a rectangular Mandapa parallel to the facade, and two Upavarnakas on the lateral side. There are two beautiful sculptural panels in this gap. So, Ravananugraha Murti on this side and Shiva Parvati playing Chaupat on the other side. There is a marvelous panel of Saptamatrika on this side, a beautiful Nataraj in this corner and a Kankal over here. You can see Kumara image in this, on this side, a Saptamatrika, a, a, a Mahishasura Mardini on this side and the Parvati Paranaya, a very elaborate uh, uh, panel of Parvati Paranaya on this side. So there's a Garbhagraha, which has a dilapidated Linga in it. And there are, there are two colossal, uh, the colossal uh, Pratihara figures on the lateral side of the Garbhagraha. Now, these are the panels. Unfortunately, it is very difficult to take a good photograph of these panels because the, the, the sun rays directly come and fall on, the, on these sculptures. So, you, you seldom find equal, uh, uniform light on these sculptures. But you can see that this is Ravan shaking Kailash. This Ravana is quite different than the Ravana in cave number 15 or cave number 16. He is seen from the back. One of his legs is stretched to get some push from the surrounding. One leg is, leg is folded and the head, heads are uh, placed in a circular manner. Shiva and Parvati, if you see the Ravan Shanking Kailash or the Ravananagraha Murti in cave number 16 or cave number 15, uh, cave number 14, you will realize that there is a lot of drama in it. Obviously, when the, when the mountain started shaking, Parvati must have, must, have, must have been frightened. And in cave number 16, in Kailashanatha temple, you can see Parvati clinging to Shiva. She is she's, 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 uh, perturbed and, and she is clinging to Shiva. And Shiva is quiet because he knows that he can handle the situation. But here, you can hardly see that drama. In, in uh, Kailashanatha temple, you can see the Dasis running. There is a, there is a big commotion on the upper, in the upper register. But in this culture, you don't see any of those things. Parvati is quiet, Shiva is also quiet, and the rest of the people are also quiet. So the bhava part of it, the emotive aspect of it, is totally absent in this culture. It is quite iconic. Something is being portrayed, something is being illustrated without really, without really uh, rendering the emotions of that sculpture. This sculpture, if you observe carefully, does not belong to this panel. This, this lady 
is more beautiful than Parvati and perhaps a later addition to this panel. The panel on the other side is one of the finest sculptures where Shiva and Parvati are shown playing Chopat. Now here you can see a lot of emotion. Parvati is angry. She, she, she has raised her hand. Well, I'll show you the details. In interrogation, she is questioning something and Shiva is trying to apprehend her, raising his finger. The medley is enjoying it. All this medley, they are enjoying that game and they are quite curious to see what is going to happen. And the lower part is an amazing uh, uh, depiction of the, 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 the playfulness between Nandi and the Ganas. The Ganas are troubling the Nandi. Some of them are trying to bite his tail. Some of them are trying to tease him. So a lot of emotive drama can be seen in this culture, which is totally absent in this part of it which clearly shows that these sculptures are carved by two different guilds. They are not the job of the same guild. Now see this. Is, there is hardly any emotion. It's very, it's very cold. Uh, if you see only the upper part of it, you will not understand what is happening at the foot. The foot, the, 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 the mountain is shaking. You can't see that shaking. But if you see the other sculpture, now see what is, see how beautiful Parvati is and watch her hands, watch Shiva's hands. Watch the curiosity on the faces of these figures. Everybody is peeping, peeping onto the board, watching what's happening on the, in, the, in, in the game. Now this emotive drama is the achievement of that sculpture. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is the uh, uh, refinement which you do not see in the other sculpture. So which are these guilds? Let's try to understand that if these guilds are different guilds, which of the guild came from where? It becomes obligatory for us to search for the origin of these guilds. Now here I have brought some, uh, I'm talking about the guilds. This sculpture of Ashtabhayatarana, which is a Buddhist concept, we know Attabhayatarana is the Bodhisattva who saves you from eight great fears. This is from cave number six of Aurangabad. You can see that this figure is very robust, has a very broad pelvic region, very broad shoulders, very upright. You can see the volume of this body. It's a very heavy, dense volume. And a similar sculpture can be found in the early caves of Elora also. This is from cave number two. Which obviously shows us, now, if I, if I don't tell you, perhaps you will feel that both these sculptures are from the same, same uh, monument. So this clearly indicates that, uh, it clearly indicates that the sculptor, sculpture guild from Aurangabad traveled to Elora. Actually, this has been proposed. Initially, it was proposed by Dr. Walter Spink. He believed that the sculptors of Ajanta traveled to Elora and kept and continued working at Elora. Then there are some scholars who suggested that perhaps the sculptors went to Aurangabad first and from there they went to Elora. I have a third possibility to suggest that the sculptors of Ajanta directly came to Elora and the sculptors of Aurangabad, who are not from Ajanta, they are, it is a different guild, they also came to Elora independently. The confluence of these two lineages can be seen at Elora. Now, there is one more pair of these uh, uh, or, or, of, of, of the Dwarapalas. Now, this is from Aurangabad. This is from cave number 21 of Elora. So, you can clearly see that the guild from Aurangabad came to Elora and also came to cave number 21. When you see all these Pratiharas or all these Dwarapalas in Elora, you notice that there must be a guild which only made the Dwarapala guilds. Go to any cave and you will realize that a certain guild has carved those Dwarapalas. The rest of the sculpture may differ from each other, but the Dwarapalas remain the same. Which perhaps means that this guild only, they didn't do anything else. They are specialized in Dwarapalas, they are specialized in Pratiharas, and they go to every cave and carve the Dwarapalas. 
So this is that Dwarapala Gil or the Pratihara Gil, hmm, which has worked at cave number 21 also. So let's keep this guild aside because they do not participate in the rest of the carving, rest of the uh, work. This sculpture is from Aurangabad. I told you that very heavy body and the significant feature is the broad pelvic region, the thunder thighs. This stocky female body comes from Aurangabad. This is from cave number, cave number uh, six of uh, Elora, Mahamayuri. And you can see that this Mahamayuri has, has traveled from Aurangabad to cave number, cave number six. And there are several such images which are, which are very robust, very stocky with very heavy pelvic region. And one of the sculptures from cave number 21 also shows these features. This, this sculpture is this particular figure is of Parvati from Parvati Parinai. The Parvati Parinai panel is divided into three, three parts. And in one of the parts, Parvati Aparna is shown uh, engaged in penance in Panchagni Sadhana. And you can see the Agni Kundas around her, these four Agni Kundas and the Surya on top of her. So this Panchagni Sadhana is from cave number 21. And in this cave, you can see Shiva appearing on the scene, trying to... Uh, Trying, trying to uh, discourage Parvati from getting married to Shiva and then Parvati gets angry. All that uh, uh, story has been depicted in this particular part of uh, uh, Parvati Parinay in cave number 21. Now, this, these figures can show an affinity. It seems that this guild, they they carved some of the female figures, they carved the Im image of Yamuna, they carved some of the figures from the brackets and they also worked on this particular panel. But along with this panel, it seems that they have also worked on two major sculptures. One is the Mahishasura Mardini. Try to recollect our discussion I tried to describe the features of these uh, figures. And you can see that the heaviness of these figures. Mahishasura Mardini in the northern Upavarnaka. And right opposite that Upavarnaka, you have this image of Kumar. See the treatment of thighs, the pelvic bones. This clearly shows its similarity with the Aurangabad uh, 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 Aurangabad The only difference is this is this is a Brahmanical image and that is a Buddhist image. Even these images in Ashtabhayatarana, unfortunately, the images were not very clear. But if you see the depiction of of uh, uh, in 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 those sculptures, it is very similar to these images. The Avalokiteshwaras saving the devotees from, from the uh, fears, they are very similar to these figures, the flying Avalokiteshwaras. So, which perhaps means that the guild that came from Aurangabad worked in early Elora, the early Buddhist caves. From the Buddhist caves, they came over to cave number 21 and worked on some of these images. This is one guild. Now let's see the northern part of it. This is Ganga. See this small figure, which is not a very significant figure, but you can see the beauty of it. You can also see the beauty of this figure, which perhaps means that Western Indian Guild has two groups. One is working on the, on the, on, on the deities and the other is working on female figures. This guild from Western India seems to be specialized in carving the beautiful female figures. And all the most beautiful female figures have been, have been uh, carved by 
this particular group of Western Indian gill. The, the bracket figures as well as the image of Ganga. This is one of the most beautiful panels from uh, Rameshwara cave. And this is the Saptamatrika panel. I think no other Saptamatrika panel can rival the beauty of this panel. Each of them is so elegant, so lively, and so beautiful. Each of them has a different posture. So now see this Kaumari, the way she has lifted her hand. The way she has... Each of them is marvelous. This is it. See this image. She's trying to... And... What we see in the beginning, which normally people don't notice, are it? Actually, I had put a line around this. Watch these two figures. And if you observe carefully, the Jattamukuta of Vinadhara Shiva or Veerabhadra and the Jattamukuta of Brahmani is exactly the Jatamukuta of the uh, of, of, of the Aurangabad style. If you see very carefully, see the gestures of these images, see the elegance of these images, and see the stockiness of this image. Does that mean that the sculptors from two different guilds started carving this particular panel from both the sides? These five figures have been carved by another one panel uh, uh, guild, and these two figures have, have been carved by another guild. It's very interesting that the same panel, there are two guilds working on the because perhaps this is, this is the challenge the uh, Sutratar has to, has to accept to finish the work in the given time. And to do that, he is trying to employ different guilds on different projects. So it is pretty clear that this figure has been carved by another sculptor and this figure has been carved by another sculptor. This is the panel which I was talking about. This is Parvati Parane. The rest of the story is shown on this side and the actual marriage is taking place over here. I have one more uh, thing to talk about it, but I'll, I'll speak about it later. In this corner, you will find Himavan, uh, like Brahma, has gone with a proposal to Himavan, and Brahma and Himavan are talking to each other. This panel is very, uh, very, very, uh, what can I say? Very shoddily carved. The proportions are not correct. The treatment is not very, very, very right. So this is almost a neglected panel. Nobody really, really bothers to see this part of the panel. Everybody is, is, is engaged with the other part of this panel. Now, the procession of Shiva Parvati's marriage is shown in the lower register of this sculpture. And this procession is, is, is very significant for a particular reason. See these details. The gunners are carrying this is this is we call it chauri. The chauri is being carried by these gunners. And surprisingly, the same thing is seen in cave number 10. This is a Buddhist cave. In the same site. On the second floor of cave number 10, which is a Chaitya cave popularly known as Kokasa Vadiya Selene or Vishwakarma Ke. You can see the same panel carved over here, which indicates that the kilts in Elora have not necessarily are not necessarily committed to a single cave. It seems that artists from one, one, one cave were invited to another cave, perhaps considering the subject matter. If you see the Kankala figure in cave number 21, 
and came number 15, you will immediately get convinced that they have been carved by the same sculptor. There's one more sculpture, which is the Shiva Parvati playing Chopat, that too has been carved by the same sculptor. So it seems that the group of carvers from one cave also went to another cave and worked on those, uh, those, those, those projects. So this is, this is a very clear indication of it. And this is the main sculpture. Now, when I say that the sculptor, the visualization of that a subject matter is given, the details are rendered by the texts. The text tells you, uh, we know that in, in India, right from from uh, uh, we have a we have a tradition of dictating the details of the of the image to the spec to the to the sculptor the sculptor so there is there is a, there is a kind of uh, 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 guidebook there is a kind of uh, handbook which is narrated to the sculptor and the sculptor is advised that matsya avatarinam devam matsya karam prakalpayet this is how the Matsya avatar should be portrayed. This is how Buddha image should be portrayed. This is how the Shiva image should be portrayed. What should be their proportions? But if you really see the sculptures, you will realize that the sculptors do not necessarily follow those instructions. The sculptors try to visual, visualize the sculpture on their own. And the placement of figures and the composition of figures is always handled independently by those sculptors. If you see this sculpture, these figures are placed in three fourth. In Vishnu Dharmottara, Vishnu Dharmottara speaks about the Rujusthanakas. The Rujusthanakas of the figures that there are some Ruju images, there are other Ruju images. Hmm? So, the, uh, so frontal images, three fourth images, profile images, all those things have been have been have been experimented by this sculptor. This kind of image is never found in Gupta sculpture. This perhaps is the, 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 the lineage of Amaravati. This kind of activation of space and the complex placement of figures comes from Amaravati. Later on, we can see it being continued at places like uh, uh, um, in, in Vidarbha. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the place where Vinobaji's ashram, Pavana. If you see Pavanar sculpture, Pavanar sculpture has this quality. And then in Western India, you can see this, this kind of activation being continued. So this, this is a very complex panel where Shiva and Parvati, the, uh, I wonder whether, whether people have noticed that here, here the hand is broken, but Parvati is accepting Shiva's hand. Shiva is not accepting Parvati's hand. And this is, this is a beautiful depiction of Parvati's upright character. That she has literally won his hand. And Shiva is shy. Shiva is, Shiva is, uh, uh, is, is feeling shy to accept her hand. And she is confidently accepting it. I think the relationship between Shiva and Parvati, which is on equal level, unlike the Lakshmi Narayana uh, uh, relationship, is depicted through this small act. Now, all these smaller things, all these all these subtle things, I think play a very important role in the aesthetics of that particular sculpture. Now, we'll come to the conclusion of this lecture. This is the ground plan. And I have tried to propose the exact contribution of each guild in this in this uh, culture. Now, as I told you, the legend, I will turn the map and then you know, so this is the Nandi Mandapa from Nandi. I, I think let's go to the next slide. So we have Nandi Mandapa, Ganga, the bracket figures, Kumar, Parvati Paranaya, Mahisha Mardini, and Ramanandra. On the other side, we have Akshakrida, Nataraj, Saptamatrika, Kankal, Yamuna, bracket figures and Pratyar. So, and I think there are four guilds which are working on these sites. One is the Aurangabad, early, uh, early Aurangabad guild. Then the Western Indian guild, the Western Indian guild subgroup and the Pratyar. That is the, these are the four guilds 
which seem to have worked in the so what i try to propose is the nandi mandapa has got nandi peetha has been carved by the aurangabad guild and it, then it proceeds to carve the yamuna along with the yamuna it also carves the bracket figures on these two pillars and proceeds to carve the third bracket pillar on the, on the other side also this ganga group it starts working on the ganga image carves this beautiful bracket figures and then perhaps they have been assigned a more important work in the upavarnaka that is the saptamatrika panel they start working on the saptamatrika panel by that time these people finish this work and join them on saptamatrika panel so collectively they complete the saptamatrika panel and from here one group goes to work on ravana anugraha so the aurangabad group proceeds to work on the the uh, ravana anugraha panel where you can see those talky figures with with no emotive uh, expression and this panel works on uh, shiva parvati playing chopa that is akshay krida panel after finishing akshay krida they proceed to work on the kankala and this group joins the other other uh, uh, western indian group to carve this ambitious panel of parvati parinya but that panel is so 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 ambitious that some part of it have been assigned to the aurangabad group probably thinking that when they want to carve parvati they want parvati very strong very stubborn very determined and perhaps that is why they chose the aurangabad group to carve that image because they wanted a very firm figure over there i think it is the imagination of the uh, of the of the of the uh, sutradhar to choose the right person for the right job so he has he has selected the specific portions for the specific kind of sculpt and then finally they work on the nataraja panel and that is the last creation of this cave so it's a small cave not many sculptures are there but whatever is there it is very ambitious every panel is very very ambitious every panel has amazing details and that uh, organization is the credit of the sutradhar so what i was trying to bring home is the indian indological tradition the archaeological tradition and the art historical tradition they seldom give thought to the contribution of the artist the artist well, normally normally the text they try to give every detail and they believe that this these details are being followed by the artist uh, the prescriptions which are which have been given the i got what i said that the creator of art is the most neglected factor in the art historical studies in india these texts the theorize things which i think i call it a cerebral invasion if you see the texts in indian 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 tradition these texts they feel that no they know everything i i i am being a little uh, a, a, a little aggressive in my statement but i sincerely feel that the freedom of the artist is never recognized by these texts every detail is prescribed as a text every detail is dictated by the text and sometimes the artists are threatened that if they do not follow these these instructions they will face serious consequences perhaps their forefathers will go to hell now this is this is very curious uh, these texts when they were they were faithfully followed i think the progression of indian art came to a sage in the early period it seems that the artists are not giving much of an importance to the text they are having their own imagination and they are trying to visualize the things in their own way but still 
whenever we talk about a monument the acharya will is always kept at the helm so the monument is attributed to the acharya it is the credit it is credited to the acharya the sutradhara we hardly find the name of the sutradhara in the inscriptions in ajanta dr dhavlikar once said that he has found a name of a sutradhara sutradhara yugandhara unfortunately that particular inscription is not seen today it is it has been lost so we do not have any name of sutradhara till some of the temples in hoysala period mention the name of the artist and sutradhara we find the names of the artist but those names are not given much of an importance just a few names are found so the uh, sutradha the acharya perhaps conceives the temple depending on the knowledge that he has inherited or he has acquired but the actual ideation or the visualization of the monument is always done by the sutradhara because he is the person who has to actually get it done he is the person who has to move the 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 uh, the, the, the the actual working team and getting it done so he has to select the right person for the right job he has to he has to get people right people from the right sources so if he has something specific in mind perhaps he will have to travel a, a little and get a person from another region so inviting people from different regions selecting people for a certain certain uh, execution and getting the whole thing done in the given time is the challenge which the sutradhara faces so it is the sutradhara tuttahara who is the aesthetic leader of that monument i think when we see a monument we must try to understand what exactly is the contribution of the sutradhara and his creative team in executing that monument this is what i wanted to establish actually i could have now i just uh, looked at the uh, watch and i felt that i could have accommodated a few more slides of nataraja because this, since it was a very well known sculpture and people have seen it quite often i did not include some of these slides in my presentation but the 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 lalita nataraj which is engaged in the ananda tandava or the sandhya tandava is one of the finest nataraj images in indian sculpture we could have spoken about it we certainly had time to speak about it but i think uh i will conclude my presentation over here and uh if there are any questions uh get engaged with that uh, that that dialogue thank you very much um ashwin can you come in thank you thank you um, professor kan uh, sham can you hear me yes yes we can hear you go ahead thank you professor kanan for that uh, most um, most fascinating analysis of um, of a single cave um, in the elora landscape cave 21 um and i think it would be an understatement to say that uh, you have unpacked so much um of of what is contained within um, uh, within that small microcosm of a much larger um, heritage site um so we do have um, a few questions uh, coming in from our live audience i'm going to start with one question from claudine um uh, but also roland um, um a related question from my side Uh, so Claudine asks, um, does one observe in other Elora caves a similar collaboration between different groups of carvers? So that's her question. I'm going to try and extend her question a little um, and ask you, sir, that um, your analysis I think um, has been quite fascinating and quite honestly um, mind-boggling um, because it kind of um, speculates and hypothesizes uh, that there were perhaps four guilds. working simultaneously in a single cave 
um, and I think you you kind of drawn out beautiful illustrations of um, of the work of these four guilds, be it the emotive drama of um, Shiva and Parvati playing Chopper or um, uh, Nandi engaged um, um, in play with the Ganas or even the Saptamatrikas and how even within the seven Saptamatrikas, um, it could well be that the first three uh, were the work of one guild while the remaining four um, were worked on by another guild. Um, so while Claudine asks, does one observe in other Elora caves a similar collaboration between different groups of carvers, I want to take that question forward a little and say that uh, are there parallels in what you've spoken about um, uh, with other sites in India? Or is this something which is quite unique to Western India? I mean, can we see something like this happening in other parts of the country as well? Thank you. I, I think uh, it's a very, very valid question. In Elora, you can see uh, you can see this kind of collaboration. Particularly in later Elora, if you see Kailashna Temple, you can see several guilds working over there, and the distinction distinction is so uh, so so uh, uh, marked that you can you can very easily say that this group comes from Patarakal, this group come, comes from uh, Mahabalipuram, this group. So identifying the groups or the guilds is very simple in the later monuments of Elora. But it seems that in early Elora, in the Buddhist caves, there are only two guilds. One is the Aurangabad guild, the other is the Ajanta guild. Somewhere in cave number third, fourth, you can see the Western Indian guild being introduced on a very minor scale. And then they start getting better work. They start getting more and more work. And their presence gets, gets, gets more and more conspicuous. I know that my presentation was a little simplistic because in one hour's time, I could not could not point out every detail. But what I was trying to trying to say, I think I could I could uh, uh, I could impart it to my audience. So you can see these guilds being introduced at a certain level, and their presence being felt. At some juncture, the guilds start getting more and more assertive, and they try to try to try to introduce their own features in their sculpture. It's very interesting. A modest introduction of the Western Indian Guild in cave number three and four becomes pretty conspicuous by this time in 20. Rather, they take over almost the whole cave by the, by, by, by the time they reach cave number 21. But yes, what, what uh, Claudine asked, that is it is it visible in the other caves of Elora? Yes, it is. It is very, very vividly visible. Sir, and in your experience, um, what about ah, other parts? about the other monuments which you, you are asking? There, it seems, particularly in structural temples, it seems that a single guild comes prepared to work on that project. Like if you go to Kajurao, you can see that the whole temple is built by a single guild. Or if you go to you go to Hoysar temples, the whole temple has been built by a single guild. That that perhaps is the feature in medieval period. By that time. I think the guilds were very, very uh, well uh, defined. But in the earlier period, there is a lot of experimentation. Till 8th century, you can see a lot of experimentation. So would it also be right then to speculate that with the passage of time, the stranglehold of the canonical text, the Agamas, which you referred to, kind of gained momentum and took precedence yes. over individual creativity? Certainly, certainly, certainly. And by 10th over, uh, 10th, 10th century, I think it was almost a straight jacket, which was very difficult for the artist to escape. So whatever they had to show, they had to show in the given framework. Sorry for pressing, sir, but in your in your wide experience, um, is there any other site in any part of India where it is so stark, um, This the fact that there are several stylistic influences uh, simultaneously happening because of multiple guilds working? Have you seen, would you be able to contrast uh, to something else? Uh, I, 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 I think it is more obvious in Elora for a simple reason that it is a huge site. And at this particular time, I think the sculptors are still experimenting. So in Ajanta, yes, you can see several guilds working together. In Ajanta, if you see cave number 26, the uh, I hope everybody, every, every uh, listener remembers that sculpture. If you see the sculpture of Mara Darshan or Mara Pralobana, the, in which Buddha is shown defeating Mara, 
that sculpture is stylistically very different than the rest of the sculptures. Uh, so the reclining Buddha, that is uh, Mahaparinirvana, the seated Buddhas and these sculptures, they are, they are stylistically uh, very different from each other. And you can see the, 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 the presence of the Southern Guild in some of these sculptures. All right. Um, so... Or if you see the earlier caves, like Pital Khora Cave, in Pital Khora Cave, some of the sculptures are very sophisticated. Some of the sculptures are very crude. If you see Kondane, in Kondane, you can see some of the sculptures, right? This, this is true about all the early, early caves, where some of the sculptures are highly sophisticated and some are quite folkish. Hmm. Okay. So I'll move on to uh, our next question, sir. And this comes from a viewer, Prashant. Uh, who is uh, um, wanting to know more about uh, this idea of activation of space, which you spoke of. So Prashant asks, um, this concept of space, is it not present in the Dashavatara temple at Devgarh, uh, which, also, which also shows some aspect of space being given importance um, in the relief sculptures there? Um, and doesn't it come from the Gupta period? And I think he's referring to your statement that the Gupta period sculpture panels uh, do not necessarily use this concept of activating space. So he wanted you to throw I, some light on. Is this a good right, right. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what I was trying to say that if you see Amaravati sculpture, particularly the sculpture, actually, uh, when we when we speak in the class, you can actually show the visuals. Unfortunately, I won't be able to do that. But since this gentleman seems to be well acquainted with Indian sculpture, he will understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, if you see Amravati sculpture in which the uh, child is being handed over to those four gods, if you see the placement of those four gods uh, immediately after birth of Buddha, those gods have been placed in such a manner, the depth of the sculpture is not much. It is perhaps the physical depth of that sculpture is perhaps one and a half inch or one inch, not even one inch. But the sculptor has managed to create a virtual space. By placing them in a circular form, the sculptor has created a virtual space between them. Now, this creation of space, this construction of space is not seen in Gupta sculpture. If you see the Devgarh sculpture, the Devgarh sculpture, the background is quite evenly carved. And of course, there are some technical limitations also because if you are carving a sculpture on a structural temple, the depth of the sculpture has to be uniform. Otherwise, the stone will break. If, if it is, if it is uh, deeper at one place and shallower at another place, that kind of carving cannot be afforded in structural temples. It has to be uniformly carved. It has to be uh, evenly carved. But in cave temples, you can go as deep as you want. So if you see some of the sculptures from cave number 15 of Elora, you can actually enter into those sculptures. Or if you see the sculptures of Elephanta, you can you can be a part of that sculpture. People people can enter into that sculpture. Some at some places the depth is six feet, eight feet, which is not possible in a structural temple. So in structural temples, this activation is not uh, very easy. But Amaravati sculpture, though is carved on very thin plaques, they have managed to create this space, and they have activated that. When I say activated. I mean to say that these images, they literally emerge from, 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 from the background. If you see Devgarh images, now there are, there are two or three major, Naranarayan panel is there, then uh, uh, Karibharada panel is there. If you see Karibharada panel, Garudarudh Vishnu is stuck to the sculpture, stuck to the wall. He doesn't emerge from the wall. It is stuck to the wall. So it is, it is, it is a blind background. It is a neutral background on which these figures have been carved. If you see the, the uh, Elephanta sculpture, the Elephanta sculpture, he, he comes out of the rock. He literally emerges from the rock. That is the difference. Thank you, sir. Um, we have um, a question from um, a viewer, Vijayanti Chakravarti, who says, uh, thank you very much, Professor. Um, Maybe unrelated, but she's curious to know how you would compare the Rameshwar cave temple uh, with Dumar Lena in terms of the gills as also the aesthetics. I think she's referring to cave 29. Yes. For herself. 
suits. I'm 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 thankful for this question because Dumar Lena is a conundrum in itself. The quality of Dumar Lena. Let I'm, I I I know I'm being a little uh, harsh, a, a little crude, but I think the quality of Dumar Lena sculpture is bad. You seldom see such crude sculpture in Indian tradition. If you see the uh, uh, Nataraja sculpture in Dumar Lena, it is so clumsily carved, and the other sculptures, are other other images, are very heavy, sometimes out of proportions. And I keep wondering that how only one of the kids in Elora can have such inferior sculpture. The reason could be, it seems, uh, this is this is my hypothesis, that it seems that when they started carving the Dumar Lena, the, the ground plan is exactly like elephant. It is it imitates the elephant ground plan plan very faithfully, and it is it is one of the one of the most colossal caves of Elora. It's a huge cave. They must have started working on this cave. They the architecture was complete when they started working on the sculpture. That is the period when the Kalachuris were defeated at the hands of Chalukya. There is there is there is an inscription which was found in in uh, Mahakunta temple and then now it has been shifted to Bijapur Museum. That inscription says that in uh, uh, 601 or 2, the Kalachuris were defeated at the hands of Mangalesh and the money that was looted in this in this uh, yeah, was utilized towards the uh, renovation of Mahakuta temple. So it seems that the, when the temple was half carved or they just started carving the sculpture, the work came to a sejer because of this defeat. Kalachuris who started because Kalachuris are, are uh, Pashupatas. They must have started carving uh, uh, the, the Chalukyas are Vaishnavas. They must have started carving this uh, cave and the work came to a sejer. But obviously, uh, because the Chalukyans too were Hindus, they must have continued that work or somebody else must have taken it after, after a hiatus of about 20 years. By that time, all those guilds which were working on that site must have left. And the continuation must have been taken over by lesser group of sculptors. So the the plan is 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 uh, uh, faithfully followed. The program of the sculpture is a uh, program of the cave is faithfully followed. The iconography is faithfully followed, but the aesthetic element is totally absent. The sophistication of the sculpture is not there because perhaps the guild that took over after twenty years must have been a lesser guild. They tried to imitate. The earlier uh, they tried to imitate Elephanta, but could not reach the sophistication of it. Sir, uh, speaking about guilds and continuity of guilds, um, there is a follow up question from Prashant who is asking uh, Could there be a continuity of guilds between Ajanta Elora and some of the early temples in Bhuvneshwar? Would you be able to comment on that, sir? No, Bhuvneshwar is much later. No? And Bonesh will be Bonesh will be uh, nine tenth century. I I think by the and and I think these the the guilds working on cave temples must have been the different guilds than the guilds working on structural temples. Right. So it's not just um, uh, the style and the stylistic influence, but it's also the technicality of the kind the technical, of work, yes the kind of work which they were doing. Sir, I want to take you back. Um, to what was a, a very intriguing um, um, statement you made on, on Riti and Vritti, uh, mm. on, uh, on style being a voluntary choice and also Vritti being the temperament of the artist. Right. Uh, so I believe that these are fairly novel concepts um, for a large part of the audience today. So can you speak a little bit more about both Riti and Vritti, sir? Uh, like Riti is one of the aesthetic schools in India. And most of the people who have written about Riti or Indian uh, or, or, or uh, other uh, elements in Indian aesthetics, they very conveniently translate Riti as style. Riti is very close to style, but here, uh, even, even the Indian scholars accept that Riti is Prati Kavi Sthita. Every, every artist has, as Kavi is artist, Kavi is poet, but also an artist. Every artist has his own style. 
but the style has to be this this, this uh, involuntary style has to be surrendered and the artist will have to choose the right style for the right expression if he wants to express something theatrical if he wants to express something passionate he is advised to opt for a little like gaudi because gaudi riti is is uh, very flamboyant gaudi riti is exaggerated gaudi riti is very intense so if you want to want to show something in a very intense manner it is better to choose gaudi riti and of course how to how to uh, how to perform how to compose in gaudi riti is also instructed in this text but if you want to say something very lyrical if you want to say something very contemplative like the uh, like like the megadutha then vaidarbi would be a better choice then so there there are several rites which they have talked about and they have proposed different kind of rites for different kind of expressions which means that a single artist may express in five different rites five different styles if we go by the western notion of style everybody michelangelo has his own style leonardo has his own style uh, so even the modern painters like picasso has his own style and they do not surrender their style whatever may be the subject matter so i think the different lies here but much before the notion of riti came into being bharata has talked about the vrittis and he says that artists have different temperaments and these vrittis play a very crucial role in formulating the final form of the expression or the drama the dasharupakas the 10 different forms of drama are thankful to the vritti of the artist some artist might be playful in nature so naturally he would go for a play which is which which is which is a humorous play which may be a wit or bhana or or a person who is more serious temperamentally he would go for a more serious play so the the temperament of the artist plays a very important role in the final product of the drama that is that is what bharata says so bharata talks about the individual temperament of an artist and uh, bhamah dandi and vaman they say that that individual temperament should be controlled and the right expression should be chosen for the right topic interesting um thank you sir thank you uh, there are a few more questions which are very specific on um, on um, on specific parts of the panels which you have shown but that will probably mean that we have to go back and look at these panels carefully so i'm going to skip some of those questions sir but uh, and we are also at 7 o'clock now so i have just one last um, a somewhat personal kind of question to you sir but um, you wear many hats i mean um, uh, you're an art historian of course an academic uh, but you're also a playwright uh so yes, i was sir. wondering how um um your explorations and your inquiries into into these somewhat what one may appear as uh, as different fields so how does one inform the other for example the fact that you're a playwright um uh, how does that inform your work in art history and art appreciation <laughs> i i it was just out of curiosity that i started working in the, basically i am a sculptor and i think all my art historical writing is from a sculptor's point of view so about two of my books on elora uh, a book which is which which we recently published with my co-author kanika gupta called lupadakhe which is about the artists uh, even even the recent book adrugamrani all these art, all, all these works are from the from the point of view of a of a practicing artist i always felt that the artist is always neglected uh, by by the indian text and indian art historians uh, so it was it was a very sincere attempt to uh, look at history from a slightly different perspective so so whatever came my way i tried it so i i felt that uh, there is a lot of theatrical theatrical element in indian sculpture and uh, my my plays are historical plays but i try try to give a contemporary uh, contemporary uh, relevance to it so i try to look at history from a contemporary point of view and try to write it so it is it is a sculptor's point of view basically <laughs> yeah 
I think uh, some phrases from your lecture are going to stay with us for a long time, sir, especially the fact that uh, you mentioned on multiple occasions that artist is, is often neglected, and I think that is going to stay with us for some time. Okay. But thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Kannan, for this um, most illuminating lecture. And I think we are going back home from this uh, talk, not just with a wealth of information, uh, but also an abundance of new perspective and new ways of looking at historical art. So thank you very much. Um, for that. Uh, and I hope you will uh, continue to engage with us at Tamil Heritage Trust and we can benefit from um, your expertise. Thank you. I'm aware that I was a little simplistic in my approach today because I wanted to say so many things in a, in a, in a period of uh, 60 minutes. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm happy that some very pertinent questions were raised and that gave me an opportunity to elaborate on my views further. So thank you very much. I think it was a great experience to talk to your audience. Uh, and and uh, uh, I, I, I feel honored that Tamil Heritage Trust invited me for this talk. Thank you very much. Pleasure is entirely ours, sir. And we do hope that um, you will come back and speak at Tamil Heritage Trust uh, on other topics of your interest as well. Sure. Thank you sure. very much. And to our audience, thank you for staying with us for the entire duration of this talk. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you at next month's talk in November. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night.